All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for making a quick return from our brief coffee break. Many of your colleagues will continue to stream in, so please be mindful of the fact that uh, just allow them to shuffle into their seats as soon as they do head in. For those of you, though, who are already here in the plenary, we'd uh, appreciate it if you uh, grab your seats, settle down, and get ready to uh, hear from our next speaker. As we've heard throughout uh, the last two days, essentially affordable housing has been a critical area of interest for real estate developers from a financing point of view, looking at the urbanization trends, but of course making sure that we also speak to the end users' needs. How are we addressing this from a regional point of view as members of Sub-Saharan Africa, but also are there key nuances with regard to particular trends that we see from a country point of view and of course understanding how we can build better solutions to actually address these needs in an affordable manner while still making a solid return on your investment. We'll start off this part of the conversation with a presentation which will run for about anything from 25 to 30 minutes. It will likely incorporate Q&A, however, we'll also build up following the presentation by having a panel discussion. Doing this, we'll be speaking to industry representatives who have on the ground experience as to what the successes, the failures and opportunities are when it comes to understanding the affordable housing market in Africa. So you will also be able to participate in that panel discussion via conversation and a Q&A session, and that will take us up to lunchtime. Another brief reminder before I do step down from stage, uh, for those who had won awards yesterday, the API um, annual awards, we would like to remind you that uh, there's uh, additional um, uh, details, documentation, and of course, um, certification that can be uh, received from the registration table. So if you know anyone or are one of the winners, please do just give alert them to the fact that they do need to report to the registration table in order to receive more insight and um, uh, the additional documentation or prizes that were outstanding yesterday. But because we're all excited, we're keen on understanding more about affordable housing, let me not hold you back any further. Allow me to warmly welcome on stage, ladies and gentlemen, our first speaker for today. He's talking about the theme about smarter building solutions for Africa's housing market. Warmly welcome on stage, Eckhard Duak, Chairman of uh, Zero Carbon Designs from the UK and Kenya. A warm welcome. Don't you ever go. Climate change. This was it. Climate change. More than 30% of the global CO2 emissions are coming from buildings. And we all can have a huge impact there. And that is what I'm focusing on with my investments here in Africa. It starts with building material production, design, construction, property management, facility management, operational phase, and so on. Yes, we're making progress, uh, but we're basically looking at the operational phase. We are looking at renewable energy, solar power, wind power, things like that. And that's great, but there's not a lot of focus on building material. And uh, that's where I want to uh, give you some further insight uh, during my presentation today. I would like to start with uh, the urbanization in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, this chart shows you that uh, from 1990 to 2014, uh, urban population increased from about 130 million to uh, 350 million uh, people. And uh, it's because of urbanization, people moving to the cities and also population growth. What's disturbing for me is that more than 50% of that are actually living in urban slums. And when we talk about affordable housing, it's all relative. And uh, we are talking about a middle class that is actually not the middle class, but the upper class. And we are forgetting about the majority. And that is another topic I would like to address during my presentation. This is interesting from my point of view. When you look at where the population lives in urban centers, the vast majority lives in urban centers with less than 300,000 inhabitants, and that will stay like that uh, up to 2030. So it's not the mega cities, it's really the, the secondary cities where the growth is, where we can make a change, and where we also have to focus. 
I'm now moving on to Rwanda, to Kigali. Uh, reason being, I have a factory in Kigali and I know uh, the country quite well. Um, over 90% of the population, or about 90%, earns less than $500 a month. When we look at what people can afford to buy, the, the bottom, is it? That doesn't show the whole thing here, does it? Yeah, the, the bottom, um, just a second. Over 50% can afford to buy a house that's about $2,200. So not $10,000 or $20,000 or $50,000, $2,200. or more, not, no, 80 to 90% cannot afford to buy the lowest priced formal house in Kigali, which is around $21,000. So when we talk about affordable housing for the middle class, we are actually talking about the top 10% of the population and forget about 90%. And I think that's an important thing to, to look at and we've done a lot of focus group interviews, hired consultants to talk to people with lower income to see what kind of preferences they have because we can't build a three bedroom house with bathroom and kitchen and so on for someone who earns $150 a month. And it, it's really interesting, we have to change our perception and, and clearly look at this segment because they are the ones who move in from the countryside into the cities, they move into new slums, they make the problem bigger, and that's where I think we can have a quick impact by, you know, with the right policies and master plans and so on, um, and, and, and help to prevent that part at least. Um, so. Coming back to the um, focus groups, most of these people are happy to share facilities. They are interested in incremental construction, in sweat equity, and so on. So it's that there are solutions that you can build for three or four thousand dollars that they are happy with. Yes, there's a part that is social housing and that clearly needs support also from governments. But uh, I just wanted to raise that uh, because I think it's an important point not just to focus on the top 10% of the population. Very quickly, traditional building materials. Um, traditionally, we build single-story houses, adobe, wattle and dow, burnt bricks, compressed stabilized earth blocks, concrete blocks, and so on. Some are durable, some are not very long-lasting. A lot of them have a really bad impact on the environment, deforestation and, and so on, because a lot of energy is actually used inefficiently to burn bricks, to, uh, to, to produce other materials. Um, and going forward, these are not the materials we can use to build urban, uh, urban accommodations, because we have to go up, we have to build multi-story, and, uh, and these are cl clearly for single houses that are on a, on a single plot, single story. So this is just a picture of informal housing construction uh, as an example. And this, uh, this is a slum in, in Nairobi uh, where I'm also active. Uh, so over 50% of the population lives like this. And uh, you see that has all kinds of effects and you know that uh, there's no infrastructure. so a lot of diseases and so on, and that's, that is something we, we should also look at and, and, and change. The way forward, uh, and I come back to Kigali again, is really good master planning, and I, I find that is missing in many cities, um, and supporting government policies, and a clear will by the politicians to implement that and to support that, and not just talk about hundreds of thousands or millions of new units that they want to build, but actually create the framework and also deal with uh, land ownership titles and things like that. So in Kigali, um, they have made great progress and, uh, and I think that's an example for, for many other cities to, to look at. Um, as I said, in urban centers we have to change typologies. There is not enough land around to build single, uh, uh, single dwelling units single-story dwelling units for everyone in, in the city. So this is a design we've done for, for Kigali again, um, where we're looking at apartments 
at uh, row houses and so on, but still designed in a way that they can be affordable. And part of that is clearly the building material and uh, alternative building technologies, because we are talking about large scale. We are not talking about building 50 or 100 houses somewhere. We are talking about tens of thousands or, or even more. So we're looking at what, what, what technologies are there. And uh, I'm just showing a couple here, like uh, precast concrete and uh, aluminum shuttering and, and so on. The problem is all of these are, 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 or is that um, they're not environmentally friendly. So they have a huge impact on, on climate change, especially when we build hundreds of thousands or millions of, of units like this. And I've, uh, I've invested over the last 10 years into material that uh, actually has a negative carbon footprint and uh, our ABT is based on straw. So local value chain using straw that is waste for the farmers, rice straw, wheat straw that they are burning. So not straw that's being used for cattle or animal feed or mulching or whatever, but for instance in Rwanda 70% of the straw is wasted. And uh, based on that we have a technology that is, has been around for many, many years. We compress it, we heat it, compress it and make modular panels out of it. They are fire resistant, the impact resistant, load bearing and so on, and I come to that in a minute again. And these, these modules uh, allow us to build very fast. Very fast and lightweight. Lightweight means less cost for uh, substructures and uh, fast means less financing cost as a developer, for instance. So when we look at the overall cost of a project, it's not just the material cost, or, yeah, it's also the financing cost, the speed of construction, and, and, and being able to save money uh, in other parts than just the, the superstructure. Um, we've done extensive material testing. This material has been around uh, since the 1930s in, in Europe, and there are about 250,000 houses in, in England and many buildings in Germany and other countries that have been around for 50, 60, 70 years. Um, so when it comes to compressive strengths, to load-bearing capability, we have been able to improve the, uh, our system so that we can build up to three stories load-bearing with these panels, without steel, without concrete, without wood, um, all from rapidly renewable uh, raw materials that come twice a year on the fields and are waste. Um, when it comes to fire rating, we have up to 90 minute fire ratings for the walls. So in, in Germany, we use them in office buildings as partitions and meet German standards. Um, when it comes to soundproofing, it's, it's, it's very good soundproofing. So when you use it as partition compared to gypsum board, for instance, you need a boardroom that's quiet. You can use this material, it's soundproof. It's even bulletproof when you use a double two panels um, with, with a, a 765, you, you shoot at it and, and it's stuck uh, in the first panel. Um, so it can absorb a lot of energy and that's, uh, that's interesting when you look at fire tests, you have a, like a 1300 degree blowtorch going against that for half an hour and it doesn't, you turn it off, the, the flame disappears, it doesn't continue to burn. It's not even hot on the other side. There's about one centimeter of charcoal on, on, on the, where, where, you, where you had the fire. So uh, there are a lot of good properties. Another one is compared to, to, to gypsum board partitions, for instance, you can hang TVs or mirrors or whatever anywhere you want. Every screw can carry about 80 kilograms load and you use normal wood screws for this. Yeah, it's so densely pressed that, uh, that, that it holds that. This is an example of a building that uh, a convention center in Germany that was built in 1965. Uh, and the complete roof, seven and a half thousand square meter, was built with exactly this straw panel. And it's still on there today. Uh, I sent some engineers to talk to the facility managers. They didn't even know that they had a straw roof because they never had a problem with it. They were there for 15 years as facility managers and didn't know they had a straw roof. So, we know it performs, we know it's long-lasting. Uh, it's not that we, we use a material with question marks. 
and uh, and that was important for me as well because uh, I, you know that is an uh, quality and durability is something that is important when we talk about building large number of, of, of units. We then started uh, in 2012 in Addis, uh, working together with the university there, the university in Germany, Bauhaus University, and in Switzerland, um, in Zurich, to look at uh, solutions for uh, the urbanization. How can we deal with the, 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 the people that, is not, that are not the middle class, the top 10%, but, but with people who are moving into the city? Um, and they developed some typologies here where they have sh shared facilities. Um, we reused a lot of material to test that. This building has been there now for six years and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's in, in good, good shape. It's being used by the university, and it shows that it can be done. I think the cost for that was about twenty thousand dollars, and we had uh, uh, it's for four families uh, with shared bath and and kitchen facilities. From there, we went on and and partnered with um, the Rwanda Green Fund for Nerva, uh, and that had different parts. The one was to build multi-story uh, model buildings in Kigali, and you see that in the background there, the, the, the yellow building, the three-story building, is uh, the structure is completely made from the strawboard. Um, yes, sometimes we double it up in the external walls, so a board is about 60 millimeters thick, so we have 12 millimeters, uh, 120 millimeters external walls, and, uh, and we have one center wall structural that, that has three or four panels uh, screwed together. So it's, it's very quick to, to build this because it's a dry process. Uh, we used a lightweight steel frame as a, for the slabs and, and straw board again on top of that. So even that, there was no curing time, nothing. And uh, it, it showed that it's, it's, it's possible to do that and, and is a good demonstration. Then we, uh, on the left, that's part of focus group interviews that were also done then later in, in Rwanda. Uh, and confirmed what we found before. Uh, so, so this this partnership was was very imp uh, important for us because we also worked with the Global Green Growth Institute (GGGI), uh, and and they've called us uh, to talk about a number of projects in in other countries now. This is the modular system. Uh, the panels we cut them in the factory, uh, cut out windows, doors, everything, they are numbered. Um, the, the production, it's a, it's a continuous production process, so in the production we already cut the lengths we need for the building. So if it's three meter ceiling height, it's a three meter panel. There's no waste, we have no waste at the, at the site, we don't have to cut things in the factory, that's already done when it comes out of the, the machine. And on the right hand side here you can see um, how that's done, and we can, we can do with six people one floor in a day. Yeah, that's, that's about the speed we, we can build with that. If we want to go higher up, up to eight stories, we also produce uh, these lightweight steel frames. Uh, it looks like a lot of steel, but it's actually not. It's very thin. It's between 1 and 1.5 millimeters. And we, we do the design so that we end up with complete uh, again, the complete package pre-assembled in the factory, taken to the site, and uh, units that are about 14 meters, up to 14 meters long, and, uh, and then assembled on site. Another uh, thing is uh, prefabricated housing, where we go a step further, we, f we complete the, co uh, the walls. So there you see the straw board again, lightweight steel structure, windows, doors, everything there, and uh, to build this five by seven meter house uh, takes four and a half hours. So what you see here is, is four and a half hours, um, and the cost is below $10,000. So for 35 square meters, yes, you, you need more time than to put in the, 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 the toilet and things like that, but, uh, but the building is, is, is finished within that period of time. And this can also be done for multi-story, so we can, in the factory, and that's, from my perspective, an important point, to control the quality, the more we can do in the factory, 
the better the quality of the final building is because, you know, when I, I look at friends and they're building with bricks, 100 houses, and they have a good team, and it's a good house, and they have a not so good team, and, and they take some of the, the, the concrete um, and, and, uh, and sell it somewhere else, and then it's not such a good house. So, so here you can't, can't really do that. Um, last point is uh, when it comes to the construction, are partitions, I, I mentioned that before. So this on the left hand side is a university, right hand side is an office. That is an area where we can start right away. We don't have to change reinforced concrete structures for offices or apartment blocks or whatever, but we can look at the inside and start to build partitions with a, a locally manufactured product that is environmentally friendly and actually performs better than a lot of other, other products. And looks, you know, in Kigali they're always surprised how straight the walls are or the ceilings we build because it's all to the millimeter kind of. So there's, it's, it's, it's never, it's always right angle uh, and, and, and that comes for free <laughs> with it. Um, when we look at the impact, I always look at a triple bottom line, uh, economic impact, uh, clearly, uh, we have a, a strategy to establish local value chains from the farmer to production, design, construction, all of that, not all alone, so with partners, we are partnering with local de um, developers and contractors and so on. But uh, there's a lot, there's import substitution, there are jobs that um, pay, pay taxes and so on, and I think that's where I took the uh, uh, the stand to, to be the opposite of the typical Chinese development where a lot of the material is being imported. Often even all the, or many, many of the, 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 the contract, um, yeah, the, the, the workers are, are coming in and there's not that much left for the local economy. Yes, you have a nice building at the end. I'm not saying that they are not nice, but, uh, but we can really change that and make it work for the local economy. And that's also why uh, I'm not looking at building huge factories or one huge factory to serve all of East Africa. I, my strategy is to be in every country, to have a local value chain. In Rwanda, we are currently building one in Uganda. I'm looking at Kenya, you know, and other countries. And one production line can produce about 2,500 uh, 50 square meter houses per year or apartments. Yeah, so to give you an idea, and you can easily put two or three or five next to each other. In the UK, in the 1950s, there was a factory that had six production lines next to each other running three shifts. Yeah, to give you uh, an idea how uh, widely used it was, they had 15% of the partition market in, in the UK at that time. So then, uh, social impact, we do a lot of training. We work with GIZ and with others uh, on different levels. On the one hand side, students who finish uh, the vocational TVET schools. Uh, we develop curricula that are uh, certified for short courses, six weeks, um, so they can do that, get a certificate, and are qualified to work with this material. It doesn't take long, it's not rocket science. It's, not rocket science, it's easy to, to cut with a circular saw, it's easy to screw together with wood screws, uh, so it's, 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 it's straightforward, but like everything, you need to know some, some tricks. Um, we also work with, with contractors and train on the job their teams so that they can use the material, and, and we have some that are now using it for almost all their partitioning jobs uh, from low end, but even in, uh, we have a, a Kigali Heights, it's in, in Kigali, the, I think it was uh, voted for as the best building in 2016 or 17 here. Um, so a lot of the petitions there are also made from, from our board. So it's, it's not that we're talking about low quality, low cost. In Germany, we have uh, a lot of very high end, two, three million dollar houses that use this in music rooms and so on because you have a very good acoustic. Yeah, it's not, uh, not like in the concrete shell where, where you have an echo. So then uh, on the, on the uh, left-hand side, you see the farmers. Uh, in, in Rwanda, we have about 2,500 smallholder farmers who now deliver the straw to us, and some of them have a significant additional income. 
Um, so, uh, usually the women, they are smart enough, they go to the man and say, I give you a bottle of beer, and you give me your straw, and then they sell it to us. Uh, but, but that is, is, is a uh, social side. And then the environmental impact. One production line saves uh, 17,000 tons of CO2 per year, uh, just in the production of the board. And when you compare that uh, to a square meter of wall made from cement blocks or modern fired bricks, not bricks that are made by the roadside, they use about three times the energy that modern fired bricks use and much more mortar because they are uneven. Um, but uh, then you can see that we have actually a negative carbon footprint of 21 kgs per square meter of wall, whereas the others have a, a positive one of 13 and 11 uh, kgs per square meter. So that is, uh, it, it's an important point that doesn't cost extra, and I just want to stress that again because many people always think that if it's environmentally friendly, it's automatically more expensive, and it's not. Yes, so we, uh, we, we just want to set that straight. So these uh, are, are partners that support us and that we are working with. Uh, so if any one of you is, is interested in talking about the technology further, um, you can see that we have a lot of support and, and it's a good network uh, that you can tab into. And um, that's, uh, that's what I wanted to say so far. And uh, thank you for listening. What we'll do is certainly delve into a panel discussion and uh, Eckhart, you will be participating in this to tell yes. us a little bit more about um, some of the highlights that you've shared with us. For, for a moment, if you could join us in the second seat on uh, the panel whilst I introduce the rest of your colleagues okay. uh, to join us. I leave this here. I think you can keep it with you in case you need to make reference to some notes. No, uh, I like that response. You didn't hear what Eckhart said. He says he has all the information in his head. So uh, not just informed, but a very smart guy too who's able to share that data with us uh, going forward today. Ladies and gentlemen, moving to the panel now, and of course this is quite a, a critical uh, conversation that we look to build up on, making sure that we do address the affordable housing needs in an appropriate manner from across the continent. I'll be welcoming the panelists on stage who will be joining us now. And this conversation will take us up to uh, lunchtime, ladies and gentlemen which uh, will commence at uh, 12.45. So we've got a good 45 minutes of an intriguing conversation which will also entail a uh, Q&A session with your participation. To tell us more about uh, the affordable housing development, a round table, this panel will be moderated by Simon Ardoncio. I hope I said that correctly. He's the head of strategic consulting at JLL. He'll be joined by Kessia Rust, who's the founder and executive director for the Center for Affordable Housing Finance in Africa, followed by Vijay Patel, chief executive officer of KD Group in Kenya, Dr. Chi Akpoji, executive director for corporate strategy and planning in Nigeria, mortgage refinance company, and also joined on stage by Mr. Graham Kosana, who represents the International Housing Solutions Company, ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome to all of our panelists and engage with them during the Q&A session today. We're missing one, sh one chair, actually. Uh, well, we've uh, had a slight change up. What we do understand is that Solim Bowen is not able to join us, so Graham is with us on stage. What we'll do, if you're comfortable, are you comfortable standing throughout the session or? If it can be arranged, we'll try and get you a chair up on stage very quickly. Is our technical team able to do so? Okay, seems like we're getting our uh, magic muscle man to uh, help us out, because 45 minutes might be a while on your feet. But to the panelists, please feel free to have a, a seat, and a chair will make its way up for you. Thank you so much. A round of applause for them, please, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. So affordable housing is, uh, is a very hot topic in, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. This has been, a wa this has been uh, the case for, uh, for a while. So I think we've got a very interesting topic to discuss about today. Um, we, we see that in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, we've reached more than 1 billion inhabitants uh, last year. This is forecast to uh, double before uh, 2050. So the, the demographic pressure is actually increasing. 
in parallel we've got uh, quite rapid urbanization rates more and more people are getting into cities in Africa to get access to jobs to get access to infrastructure to more services so we already have quite a big uh, gap and deficit in, uh, in the affordable housing segment and it is forecasted to, uh, to worsen. So we're going to discuss here uh, today with uh, our panelists how we can actually address uh, all those challenges presented to, uh, to us uh, in, in this, uh, in this uh, scheme. But first of all, perhaps let's have a quick introduction of uh, all our panelists. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Graham Cusano from International Housing Solutions. Uh, we're a small private equity business um, that invests only in affordable housing within South Africa. We've recently opened up a fund that also invests in Namibia and Botswana. So um, we've been around for about 10 years in South Africa. Uh, we've done about 27,000 homes in our first fund. Uh, we're busy investing money from our second fund. Um, and we think we'll do between 10 and 15,000 homes from that fund. Um, we get money from developmental funding institutions, uh, some of which include the IFC, who are here and um, uh, with them. We uh, also green our units. Um, in fund two, we have a goal um, set by the IFC and us to green um, 5,000 units, and we've managed to certify 5,000 so far, and uh, we've produced our first green development in South Africa, fully operational, um, called The Village in Centurion, Pretoria. My name is Eckhard Daug. Uh, I'm a German uh, entrepreneur and impact investor. My focus in, in Africa, you, you've just heard that, is, is actually the, the building material area and design. So the whole uh, part of uh, building material design construction until operations start. Uh, we have a factory in uh, Rwanda with a capacity of uh, 2,500 units per year. And uh, I'm currently building one in northern Uganda where I also work with donors uh, and, and service some of the uh, refugee areas with uh, over a million refugees out of South Sudan and uh, and Congo. So uh, we are now at a point where we can upscale. I've, uh, ca I came to, to Africa in 2011 and uh, I'm really looking forward to working with some of you in the future and maybe we can talk as well uh, to, to see how we can maybe in include uh, new materials, new approaches, uh, green environmentally friendly approaches into, into the construction industry here. Thank you. My name is Kasia Rust. I'm with the Center for Affordable Housing Finance in Africa. We're a think tank. We're based in Johannesburg. And our overall mission is to promote investment in affordable housing. And we do that by focusing on data and market analytics to try and understand what the affordable housing market looks like from one country to another, from one city, indeed from one neighborhood to another. Um, we try to quantify the demand side. Um, understand the scope of the supply side, what are the factors that are driving investment um, decision making in the market or ones that are inhibiting it. We engage both with the private sector, um, practitioners, lenders, developers and so on, as well as investors, and with policy makers um, in the, the housing and land and finance departments in a number of countries across the continent. We produce a, a yearbook, which we launch every year at the African Union for Housing Finance Conference. Um, and what that does is summarize, actually quite simply, but the housing finance situation in 54 states across the continent, um, each one about four pages long. So it's just a good summary of the kind of information that exists. And we try and use that effort to then stimulate better, better data collection by all of you as practitioners um, and by government itself so that we can share it and encourage better and more targeted inv investments that really benefit low-income earners where the need lies. Hello everyone, my name is Vijay Patel. I'm with KD Group from Kenya. 
We are a third generation private business working on a large affordable project. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Chi Apoji. I work for the Nigeria Mortgage Refinance Company. Uh, this is a mortgage liquidity facility set up under a PPP arrangement by the federal <coughs> government of Nigeria, some private sector shareholders, as well as the World Bank Group that provided the support, essentially to motivate the growth of the mortgage market in Nigeria, and by so doing, promote home ownership in Nigeria, and of course, unlock the multiplier effects of home ownership. The main things being wealth creation, jobs creation. As a mortgage liquidity facility, we raise long-term funds from the capital market with which we deploy to refinancing qualifying mortgages presented to us by um, our member banks. We're a membership-led institution. So far, how do we raise these funds? We issue bonds on the capital market. So far, we've issued two bonds and have raised a total of 55, the equivalent of $55 million, which we have deployed to the refinancing of mortgages. So essentially, we're there to catalyze the growth of the entire housing market in Nigeria. We look at the housing market in terms of a value chain with key players and financing moments at each point in the housing value chain, starting from the very beginning of the housing value chain, where you have land that is in Nigeria vested in the hands of state governors, they own the lands, and then you have developers who provide the assets that are built on the lands provided by the state governors. And then the next set of constituents on the value chain are the mortgage banks themselves. And these are our core constituents. We work very closely with them to ensure that they provide mortgages to, against the assets built on the lands provided by the state governments. And as refinanciers, we're at the very end of the housing value chain. But even though we're at the very end, we catalyze activity amongst all the other constituencies, among the other operations along that housing value chain, so that we don't wait for mortgages to come to us. We catalyze the entire process of mortgage origination and creation in working with the various stakeholders, from state governments to developers to mortgage bank and everything else in between. Um, so that's what we do, essentially. Thank you. Thank you. So we, we as JLL, we've done a number of studies on affordable housing segment across uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And we found out very various meanings for what is affordable. So I guess my first question is, is affordable housing really affordable for everyone, depending on the context we look at? What is affordable housing? And, and mostly it's used in a context that it's affordable to um, so-called middle class. Uh, that has jobs, that kind of get a mortgage, and uh, that is not actually the middle class, that is uh, part of the top 10% of the population in sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah, so, uh, yes, there are good projects and like, like yours that, that cater to that, and there's a huge demand, and that's also something I think is important to keep in mind. We always talk about the need of millions and millions of units, but the demand is not equal to the need. Demand is need plus money. Yeah, and, uh, and, and there, uh, that's the one thing. The other thing is that the majority of the population, uh, they really need what I would, would call low-cost housing. And there we have to go different ways. We have to look at sharing facilities. We have to look at incremental construction, about, uh, talk about sweat equity. Um, and also talk about different ways to finance, and I think we will talk about that later. But uh, keep in mind, in Rwanda in, or in Kigali, 90% of the population in Kigali rents and doesn't own. So we don't turn that around into 100% ownership. Thank you. Chi, would you like to give us uh, an idea and perspective on, uh, on the notion of affordability? Yes, the issue of affordability, you know, I know this is the theme, the main theme of this, but I'd really like us to look at it more broadly. 
can we really have a definitive definition of, of affordable housing? Uh, in the various uh, uh, fora that I've been a part of, that it has come up, uh, it, we've had uh, so many definitions of, around affordability, all tied to the key components of income, you know, supply side and demand side, or the interplay of supply and demand side issues. Um, one definition that really comes to mind when somebody was asked, what, does it, what do you mean when you say affordable housing? And the answer was, well, it depends. It depends on so many factors, you know, uh, because there's no one size fits all definition for affordability. Uh, to get back to your specifics of the Nigerian experience, um, affordable housing might mean different things to different income segments of the Niger in Nigeria. Um, the income pyramid is such in Nigeria is such that up to 80% of Nigerians, unfortunately, fall within the lowest income level category. 80%. So what kind of housing would you be targeting you know, for them? What kind of uh, housing would you be you know, building for them? These are people who earn less than, I heard in uh, um, Eckhart's presentation, people earn less than $500 a month. Well, in Nigeria, it's even far less than that. Far less than that. Uh, annual salary is about 18, annual income is about, minimum uh, wage is 18,000 Naira, which is about $50, yeah, $50 per month. That's the annual uh, income uh, of, uh, of the average Nigerian. So what kind of housing would really uh, fit that income target group? There have been various efforts at really building houses for them. But none has really been successful without direct government intervention, not only in terms of providing the land, but also providing the financing as well as the necessary subsidy, enabling maybe private sector investors to come in and actually provide the housing. Um, there's one particular well-known affordable housing project uh, known, uh, actually been uh, project managed by a foundation known as the Millard Fuller Foundation. So this foundation, they build very basic houses with the barest minimum of materials, uh, ranging from, let's say, $2.5 million to upwards of five, uh, 2.5 million Naira, so excuse me, to upwards of 5 million Naira. So 2.5, that's about between five and $7,000. But even then, they have issues of uptake of these houses. And these are the most affordable houses that are right now available in Nigeria. Most developers in Nigeria, of course, are concerned with quick returns on their investment. So they either target the middle market or the higher end market. So for me, what we try to promote at NMRC is an affordable housing matrix involving what we call the four Ps. The public sector, meaning government, state government as well as federal government, the private sector, second P. The third component, P, is not just the partnerships, but the people themselves. Because they need to be involved. The community that you're targeting needs to be involved. The low income people need to be involved. They need to also be part and parcel of the whole process of design of the building, make inputs into the infrastructure, into the services and facilities that will be provided, and more importantly, play a monitoring and evaluation role to ensure that what was designed, what was on the project, a project paper, is what is delivered. And of course, the fourth P will be the partnership of all three components. That is what the Millard Fuller Foundation is doing to some extent. We're encouraging other groups, not necessarily foundation, but other developers to begin to think more along those lines. You know, uh, because in the fire analysis, when building affordable houses for the mass market, the profit levels might not be as high, might not be quick, but at least in terms of the volumes, that is where in the fire analysis, that's where the profit margins lie. So the volume 
uh, the scaling up in the, in the amount of houses being delivered or being built, that is where the profit will lie. And of course, in addition to the profits is the sense of uh, due corporate social responsibility in managing or helping to develop the economy. Kesha, would you like to add something on uh, the notion of affordability? I mean, I, th I think the question, when we think about affordability, it's really the confluence of three things. It's, it's the income of the household um, and how much disposable the income they have to dedicate to housing, some of which may already be occupied because of their current situation, rental or, or their access to services. And then it's the cost of the house itself. We spend a lot of time thinking about that um, and ways in which to minimize that. Um, and, and there are different options and examples across the continent. And then thirdly, it's the financing. And that's not only the end user financing, which is critical, but also the whole value chain of financing that goes into, and that contributes to the cost of the house as well, and, and, and so on. Oftentimes when we have this discussion about affordability, we sort of get stuck on the first one, the household income. And we sort of shake our heads and say, there's just nothing we can do. And, and I have to say that in this country, in South Africa, in some ways it's almost been sorted because the government put a threshold and said any household earning less than three and a half thousand rand, which is about 50% of our population in South Africa, is actually our responsibility as government, private sector, you don't need to deal with that. That's not going to work across the continent. There are neither governments that can afford that, and it's certainly not sustainable. We're finding that out in South Africa as well. Um, so the real challenge is, and, and frankly, the real opportunity, because these are very large populations we're talking about in very different um, jurisdictions with, in some cases, quite favorable legislative and policy environments. Um, the challenge and the real opportunity is to design the credit and the, the, the house product in a way that suits the income parameters of the household. That has to do both with their quantum, how much they can afford to pay every month, and also the, the shape of that. Some of that income might be informally earned um, or might be seasonally earned, so that my annual income is something that you could accommodate and think about a credit product on, but it only happens in six months of the year, and how do you structure that? And I think the real opportunity for investors, whether they are on the finance side or on the, on the property side, the, the construction side, or rental, is to structure their products and services to match the particular income dynamics um, of a very diverse population. So we can say there is a segment that may well be too poor, but in many instances, that segment of the population is probably living outside urban areas anyway. The urban population, there is money flowing. And what we have to work out, and you know, congratulations to the first one that actually manages to do that, because there really is a market there, is how to package the product and the service to match that opportunity. Thanks. On the supply uh, side, Vijay, would you like to um, give us your views on what are the main uh, inhibiting factors um, allowing supply? In terms of uh, the supply, we see three key, effectively, obstacles that are limiting the supply. Sorry. Um, so when we started researching this sector, we classified the issues into two main buckets. The first is what we call the real issues, and the second is what we call the perceived or derivatives of the real issues. So when we talk about the real issues, and I talk only in the context of the Kenyan economy and the Kenyan market, is that why do developers not want to uh, put more money into this when the demand is so obvious and so clear? Is because in terms of Kenya, we have very high interest rates. And over the last two years, we have also been sort of victims of uh, crowding out effect uh, from, from the government. These are economic issues at play here which no one can solve overnight or in a day. So you just have to take, understand the reality of the situation today and then decide what your next course of action should be. Right? The number two is the accessibility of uh, uh, mortgages in Kenya is a real issue. Um, fortunately, the government is also working on the KMRC, which is the Kenya Mortgage Refinance Corporation, exactly 
the same as what Dr. Chi is doing with the, with the, with the Nigerians. Um, so we see this coming, uh, is signed, it's again seeded by the World Bank. We see it coming live over the next two years, per se, and that will help catalyze the growth of securitization in, uh, in, uh, in Kenya. And the third is we have outdated building and planning codes and lack of master planning and town planning. And this is a real problem in most African cities. Um, uh, we are here in Santon City, and this is a brand new, a very young city, and very well master planned. But we can see even around us. Uh, I've been driving around a lot of this area from Joburg to Pretoria, and 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 around, and you see a lot of decay and old, old sort of uh, unplanned uh, areas, even 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 here. So those are the three key effective issues which are limiting supply. Um, in terms of the perceived obstacles, you know, we people keep saying that there is no availability of land. <laughs> now, this is a funny one because if, again, in the Kenyan context, you know, we have uh, urbanization is 26 percent, so which means that we have 83 people per square kilometer, and if you compare that to, for example, the United Kingdom, which has 271 persons per square kilometer and an urbanization of around 87%. I think they have less land and we have a lot of land. So land is not the issue. This is a derivation of lack of planning, effectively, right? And unplanned structures. Then people talk about outdated construction methods. I mean, you've just heard Eckhart speak about the wonderful uh, process and new construction methods they are using. In Kenya today, we know that there are any modern construction technology is available. What is needed is the right project to suit the technology. Right. We have contractors from the largest contractors in the world doing projects in Kenya. So there is a definite transfer of technology, and it is not that we are still stuck building mud houses, effectively. Thank you. Gr Graham, can I ask you to uh, give us a more South African uh, perspective on, uh, on factors inhibiting the supply, please? Thank you. Um, from a South African perspective, and particularly from a developer side, um, I'd, I'd actually like to say land is an issue. Um, I think, um, yes, the, 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 the spread of people means that there's a lot of land. But by the same token, we're, we live in a world where, particularly in Africa, there's, there's, there's the wrong perception of land value. Land is overpriced, and, and that affects supply. Um, the second thing is that when you look at the value of land, it decreases as you go outside of the CBDs. And then that means that for you to then get affordable product, you're putting the people very far away from their jobs. So affordability needs to be linked with the cost of living. And sometimes we, 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 we forget that. So um, I can give an example where somebody catches three, four taxis to go to work. Um, yes, they, they can live in a free unit, but they're spending 50% of their income just on transport alone. That's, that's not acceptable, and that's, 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 that's a cost. Um, yes, uh, when, you, when, when you build affordable stuff, you have to now build at scale. Scale is key. and the products this gentleman is talking about are what we need to, to supply housing um, at scale. And that means you need to go up and limit your cost of bulk infrastructure. So to give people homes on large pieces of land, even 300 square meters of, of land means that your service costs are more than building three, four-story walk-ups with one bow connection cost at the corner of the site. So these, these are, I think, it's, 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 it's thing we have to change per people's perceptions on what it is to have a home, and the fact that to have a home does not necessarily mean that you need to live on a piece of land. Uh, to have a home is a three-story walk-up. Um, also, we need to change people's perception on, on, on size, right? Um, everybody wants a, a, as big a house as they can get, but 
affordability dictates that you cannot have that. So there's products that are now on the market, stuff like nano units, which is a 25 square meter, 30 square meter, two bed unit. And people are leasing stuff like that. There, there are some in, here in Johannesburg for two and a half thousand rand a month. That means a person earning 6,000 rand a month can afford to share one of those units, it's a two bedroom unit with somebody else. And that's, those are, I think it's, it's a mindset shift, a product shift, a building technology shift um, that, that needs to happen. Um, our governments also need to change their perception on what it is to provide housing from, from a bulk infrastructure and partnership issue. So what we've had, we've done projects where we're going for 10,000 units, very big projects. And you get into partnership with, with the government and they are meant to come over stages with, 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 with bulk. Um, it could be electricity, it could be water, it could be sewer. So as a private equity business, money burns, so we have to keep moving. And then you get to year three, you need the connection for phase four. Then they tell you, no, um, you've got no power. <laughs> um, that's, that doesn't help anybody. That means you can no longer carry on building. So yeah, planning is an issue. Um, from from, from uh, building codes, from town planning, but from financial planning um, to build at scale. That's Thank you, Graham. We're going to stay with you and uh, in the South African context. In, in your opinion, what are the key policies that government must put in place uh, to, uh, to help reducing uh, this, uh, this uh, housing deficit? So um, there's been a few policies that have been put together already, um, particularly if you look at the social housing framework um, that allows um, developers with, um, uh, with, with, with government funding to build units that are earmarked for the lower end of the market. So, and they've segmented um, the rent, at least the income bands that people uh, that qualify for those units come in. So in essence, what happens is that a developer ends up spending of their own money probably 20% in real, real finance, and then the rest is government grants of, 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 some, um, of some type or the other uh, to build the, the, the physical units. Um, the, that exists and it's happening and it's helping produce a lot of housing. But um, what also needs to happen is that there needs to be a coordination. So there's a lot of developers that then start doing these uh, projects but they stop midway because what happens is that there's a disconnect between the cash flow that they've supplied and, and, and government's budgeting process. So you get to situations where a guy is in the process of building, but all of a sudden he can't pay the contractor because the institution has not budgeted that the gentleman or lady needs a draw um, every month to carry on building, and, and that, that, that um, stops delivery. Um, the second thing, I think the focus should be on, on, on planning and use of technology. So what we have here in the South African context, we've got Johannesburg CBD, a very old CBD with many buildings that are vacant and or hijacked. So that's infrastructure. There's power, there's water, there's structures. So those buildings, instead of lying there vacant, should be converted into affordable housing. Quite, quite simply. Um, you don't have to pay for a structure. The, the, the technology, lightweight panels to put partitions and make um, beds is there. Uh, it exists. Um, you've, your plumbing is in place. I think the focus, instead of um, pushing people to outside the uh, CBDs should be pushing people to closer to where they work, closer to schools, and it, it stops urban spread. Um, and, and urban spread just 
leads to higher infrastructure costs for any city, and these cities cannot afford it. And yet, I mean, if you go to Kenya, if you go to Ghana, there's all these buildings are there. There's a lot of buildings just sitting idle. So again, it's a, it's a mind shift to um, density creation instead of, instead of urban spread. Kesha, we already, you already alluded to the fact that most uh, African government countries produce uh, the example of South Africa. So what, what policies can they implement? What are the key takeaways? I just wanted to pick up on a point that, that Graham made, which in fact does respond to your question as well. We really need to think quite carefully about our assumptions about, about what, what the expectation is for affordable housing. And Eckhart, you made the point earlier this morning as well about how many people actually rent. Um, we've, we've just done some research, it's available on our website, and, and we found that in Abidjan, it's about 78% of the population in Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire, is renting. Um, in, in Kampala, it's just over 50%. In Dar es Salaam, 50 or 70, if I can remember that correctly. And in Kenya, it's about 80%, and so on. So there is experience of rental that is happening. Whether or not that rental is happening beautifully, whether or not those are good structures that people are renting, whether they are the kind of quality housing one would expect or hope for, um, there is experience. And indeed, in Johannesburg's inner city as well, those buildings are often occupied and there are rental arrangements, often informal. So we can hold on to the fact that there's rental experience, which means that there is money that's passing between hands to occupy space. Um, can we build a product around that? So in Johannesburg, what they've done, the, the Trust for Urban Housing Finance, TUF, has is, is a mortgage lender that specifically targets small-scale landlords to buy either units on a, on a condominium or sectional title basis to refurbish them, and they, as small-scale landlords, become inner-city entrepreneurs. Um, and the finance is based not on that entrepreneur's current income stream, but like a commercial mortgage on their future income stream. So they're being given mortgage finance for housing purposes on business principles as opposed to on, on residential um, consumption principles. I would love to see that as, as a particular model applied in a city like Dar es Salaam. When you look at Dar es Salaam, it's all pastel colored pink and beige and yellow, high-rise buildings, they're falling into terrible disrepair. Most of them are, are owned by the National Housing Corporation, which was the state-owned housing, well, is the state-owned housing developer. If we could start to privatize those, but on a small-scale basis, and there I think there is an opportunity specifically for finance to come in to provide that kind of, of um, mortgage finance for small-scale entrepreneurs, but then also for the refurbishments, so a whole construction sector in terms of home improvements in those dwellings. Um, and then lastly, uh, the, off, the uh, rental management. And there I think there is a big gap across the continent about the capacity to rent, manage rental accommodation. And if we can look at that as an opportunity, there's lots of experience in South Africa that could be shared um, to build the management capacity for rental accommodation. And then work, I have um, my, my chairman speaks about this concept of massive small, lots of small projects that collectively deliver to the broad base of low-income people looking for affordable accommodation. So I think rental is a key thing that needs to be focused on, and we keep on assuming ownership. Um, South Africa has a very particular reason for that, and you know we can deal with that, Parliament's dealing with that right now. Um, but across the continent, the opportunity for rental, um, I think is a really important thing to encourage. I do think, Eckhart, that your products then in that context, I, I like that they are multi-story. Um, and that perhaps, in fact, if I can ask a question, what I would have liked to have asked of you is if once I build a single story structure, can I change my mind and two years later add a, a story on top of that? Can I build my multi-story incrementally as a small scale landlord, sort of on, you know, in a, in a suburb within a city as well? Was one of the areas I'd like to. One last point on what governments should do, and then I'll stop, sorry, um, is 
we've all heard about this, we've been talking about the value chain and the full ecosystem. And the point that, that you made, Vijay, about planning and the master plan, um, and, and just good governance, yes. doing what you promise as the state. The state, though, I think, is in a position where they are also insecure about the capacity of the, or the interest of the private sector to engage in this market. And I think there's a real opportunity for investors to communicate their interest and their expectations to the state so that it can, out of the myriad of things it needs to attend to, start to prioritize. Um, I think the opportunities in Kenya with the four pillar plan are significant in that regard. So. Thank you. Uh, you. You spoke a little bit about uh, PPPs uh, in Nigeria. Do you think that's the ultimate solution to, uh, to solve the housing deficit in the country? Yeah, um, I wouldn't call it the ultimate solution. Uh, but before I answer more directly to that question, I would just like to weigh in on the issue of rent, uh, rental, you know, you know maybe begin to think of developing products around rental, rental housing in view of the high rental levels that you find in most African countries. Same thing in Nigeria, rental levels are quite high. Most people rent, but they rent, not because they really want to, but because they have no choice but to rent for now. So what we're also encouraging within the Nigerian market, okay, yes, you might not have the requisite income, maybe to even put down a down, a down payment on a house, even if it's a, the lowest cost house, but you can rent, and then int we've introduced a program called Rent to Own. You rent, you put down an equity payment so that your rental payment goes towards your eventual ownership of that home. Uh, we still promote, ultimately, home ownership because we believe that is where the economic multiplier effects of housing really lie in owning a home. And the multiplier effects not only extend to just the economy, but also in terms of, you know, citizenship, you know, satisfaction in terms of well-being, and just the general feeling of oh, I own my own home. And in the particular case of Nigeria, eliminating some of the social ills that we have, like corruption, for example, you know that when people cannot afford the, you know, the high price of a home, they start looking for ways and means of, you know sourcing the funds in order to own the home. So these are the things we're also looking at apart from just, you know, from just uh, renting a home. Um, to get back to your question on the role of the private sector in affordable housing, in my earlier submission I had said it's not really just the private sector. The private sector, of course, should drive the supply or provide the financing for the delivery or supply of affordable housing. But it is more, much critically, critically a partnership between the public sector, the private sector, uh, and more especially the target uh, community, that is, that is the target uh, constituents for, for the developer. Uh, because they ultimately have a role to play in terms of sustainability of the housing delivery. The private sector, as, um, of course, should drive the entire effect. Government should remain an enabler in terms of providing perhaps the land and possibly the infrastructure, the site and services component of housing construction, but should really remain in the background and then allow the private sector to leverage its own comparative advantage to not only provide the financing, but also the quality of the housing uh, being delivered to the target constituents. And of course, the target constituent working or consulting with the, with the target constituent to ensure that their needs are being met, that the designs of the houses do meet their, their demands or their particular needs. That is not just building a three, four bedroom house for somebody whose income level is probably just, you know, much more uh, likely to afford maybe just a bed sit or a studio home. So those are the kinds of issues we need. So it's not just the one sector, you know, activity, it's a partnership. Sure. So as a conclusion, uh, Eckhart and Vijay, can you tell us what you see as the way forward for the affordable housing sector in, uh, in Africa? And after that, we will take a few questions from uh, the audience. Uh, 
Maybe I just quickly answer the two questions I had. One from you about uh, incremental construction, and and from Chi about uh, uh, renting, uh, rent to own. And uh, when it comes to rent to own, I think the only thing it does, it gets around the the problem of being credit worthy, having a credit history, yeah? and because it just means that you get the financing from the owner of the flat that. And if you can't pay anymore, the risk is if you don't pay, then he still owns the flat and there's no mortgage and you don't have to go through courts and so on. So it doesn't really change the position for someone who doesn't have the money to buy because you have to price in the, the financing costs in a rent to own. And if I would build rent to own, I, it would be the same cost to the, or even more maybe, to the, to the final user as if they would go to the bank and find it. Yeah, so that, there I see. That's why I think for a large part of the population, we still are looking at, at, at rental. And, uh, and uh, there was, someone said, uh, I think you managing large amount of, of, of units. So we, we are working on, on a software that is being used by a friend of mine. He set up a company called Mobisol, and they are basically giving uh, solar panels to the East African markets. He has 100,000 clients so far, uh, all uh, in the countryside, and, uh, and, and he has to manage that. They have to pay on a monthly basis. They, uh, he has to turn off the power if they don't pay. And it's all done through smart software, uh, and it's all managed out of Berlin, and we sit there on a big screen, and I can go down into a village in Kenya onto a person, I see his title of the house, when he paid exactly, and usually it's at 6.30 in the evening when it gets dark and he needs power for the light. Um, and, uh, and it's no problem. He has a minimal uh, amount of, of clients who don't pay, and he has 100,000 clients that he manages like that in sub-Saharan Africa, in rural areas, and it works. And so I'm currently looking at that to adapt that to manage rental and to include power and water and so on so that you don't have to evict people. Yeah? But if you slowly, you say, okay, then you don't have power, you know, you, you can do it gradually and, uh, and, and in, a, in a fair manner. Um, so there, there are ways to do it, but you have to come up with new technology and, 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 and other ideas. So now your, your incremental construction, yes, we, we plan like that. You have to design from the beginning. But in row housing, uh, in a row housing context, for instance, we've done that where we do two-story row houses. And then when you have, and they are very small, they are 21 square meter footprint. Um, we get the same density as three-story uh, apartment buildings with that. And you can, when the family grows, add another sto story on top, so another bedroom on top. And uh, that's possible, but also within uh, designs of, of apartment blocks, you can leave things open and later, Build, build out. So you have the floor space, but you don't have the walls and, and the, uh, everything else ready. Sorry, now I'm uh, answering. <laughs> shall, shall I hand it over to, to Vinny, I think, uh, Vijay, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a, a couple of points before I answer your question. Now, when you talk about PPP, right, uh, we believe it should be a very small percentage of the, the entire solution. And because what will happen is PPP will sort of encourage vested interests, okay, and that will skew away from that. Right? Unfortunately, we will all be still sitting here 50 years down the line talking about everyone owning their own homes. Right? The reality, even if you consider it from an asset allocation perspective, is what is the risk of an individual putting all his money, leveraging it 20 times, living from paycheck to paycheck and investing it all in a single property. Is that smart risk allocation over the long term? Right? So these are underlying questions which will limit and which drive the desire for rental. And that is why rental is available everywhere uh, around us. So the way forward uh, for us is effectively in designing housing and, and, and living areas and looking at what is the opportunity today. Um, you know, from our perspective, we are a third generation business. We are guardians for the next generation. 
we don't have resources available to commit to a subsidized government sort of business model. But that doesn't work for us, so we would not look at it. Um, ours has to sort of be profitable and feed the need of the market today. Um, and I think that way, when the pension funds and local African pension funds with, in local currency come into this funding the entire uh, development of the infrastructure of affordable housing, we see a great sort of service to this cause. Great. I, I'd just like to add something on the rental side. So we manage 10,000 units of, of, of our own in our fund. Um, I, I think for, for this continent, we need to understand that you cannot just progress into property ownership without a gap. Um, you need to create a credit profile. How do you create a credit profile? By being in an institutionalized rental framework where there is now data to validate your ability to pay. Um, that's, that's the first thing. And the second thing is that nobody is going to come out of university or wherever they come from and go straight to ownership. So to give people quality, livable space as rental accommodation is absolutely necessary. From then on, people will learn that I must buy a property, I must look after it, and this is what it costs, and this is how I can acquire a property. I think the focus too much on this continent is to try and give people a free ride into ownership. I, I really don't think it should work like that. Thank you, Graham. If we still have a few minutes before going for lunch, I would like to invite for questions uh, from the audience. Just raise your hand. Simon? Um, Simon, it's here. <laughs> Just one last comment on the rental issue. Sure. Um, it, because in Nigeria, rental payment is actually an annual payment. It's not a monthly payment, as you find in most economies here. And the message we put across that if you can pay your rent, you can pay a mortgage. If you can pay your rent, you can equally pay down a mortgage. So that is basically why we encourage home ownership. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, just one, one comment or question. There was a mention saying that rent to buy is not a valid or a viable option when trying to move people in, into property ownership. Uh, what, one model I have seen before is when they use the period of the rent to buy, whether it's a year or two years, to try and rehabilitate that person's, specifically their credit record or their, or their financial standing. And I understand that in, the, in certain sectors of, of society, that's very difficult to get them into a position where they can afford to pay the mortgage. But as you've just mentioned, maybe that rental, rather than, than servicing a landlord's um, expenses that can become their mortgage payment. So I think there are benefits to rent to buy, but I do agree with you that it isn't always that easy to move someone from not being able to afford a property to suddenly being able to afford to buy a property. Um, I, 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 I agree that rent to buy is, is, is difficult, but there's, there's a gap that needs to be explored. So. About a few months ago, we, we sat down with, with APSA, and what they wanted to do was um, to partner with us, to look at the people that are renting units from us, get sort of understand their payment profile, credit worthiness, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Even if they've had other defaults on other accounts, but if they are looking after their rental accommodation properly, they probably will pay a mortgage bond on time every month. So it's a discussion, I think it's a broader discussion with respect to rent to buy is that there needs to be a partnership between the, the developer, there needs to be a partnership with the rental institution from a management side and, and, and a partnership with the financial institution. Uh, because you should be in a position where as a developer you convert that long-term debt that you've taken into a mortgage to that person at some point. Any other questions from the floor? 
We've got one hand over there, sir. Perhaps if the mic could make its way to you. Please keep your hand up so that our colleague knows how to identify you. Thank you so much. It's on. You can go ahead, sir. Okay. <laughs> uh, my question is for Eckhart. Uh, during the presentation, you... Yeah. <laughs> I'm here. During the presentation, you explain how uh, it would take less than 24 hours to build, you know, the house uh, and under $10,000, I think. Um, have you considered working with governments of uh, countries that are just recovering from confl conflicts like Nigeria that have uh, thousands of internally displaced uh, persons and will be looking to, you know, relocate uh, these people and rebuild or re resettle them? Have you considered working with governments of countries such as uh, Nigeria? Have you considered working with governments, if I'm not mistaken, like Nigeria, where they found individuals being displaced due to crises, and as such, when they relocate them to a safer uh, arena or place, have you considered actually working with them with regard to um, in, in, uh, situations like that? That's how we understood your question, correct, sir? Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank, thank you. Um, yes, I've, I've looked at that, and at the moment we are working at the level of donors and not governments, for instance, in northern Uganda, where you have a million refugees. Um, but it's a special situation because they are welcome from South Sudan into Uganda, and they actually get their own plot. It's not the typical refugee setting that I know from other places where you have tents and rows and so on. So you actually, they are integrated with the local population, and that's where, where we uh, now build a factory to supply uh, shelters and that are longer lasting because the problem is the the uh, initial response is is that these these units don't last they last a year or a maximum two uh, but these displaced people from these countries are usually there for ten years or longer so that's that's right I've worked with uh, the government I uh, discussed that I had ministers visiting my factory where we talked about uh, um, moving 120,000 people from an area where they want to build a, a hydropower plant. It's a very big project. The problem with these big projects in many countries is that uh, they are supposed to happen tomorrow and uh, it, they don't happen for many, many years. <laughs> and uh, I've, I've, you know, initially, ten, I don't know, eight years ago, I, I would take money into my hand and do feasibility studies and would be ready to do something and uh, then um, nothing happens. So, so now I'm, I'm sitting back and I wait. So if, if you know of, uh, of projects where that is, is, is required and we can work together in a PPP, uh, I would be very interested. Fantastic. I think we'll wrap it there with the questions, ladies and gentlemen, to allow for uh, more interaction and participation during the networking session. Simon? Thank you very much, Thank you. <laughs> as well as to your panelists. Unfortunately, due to time pressures, Nguli will be sure to take your question in a separate session. But a big thank you to all of the panelists for participating. Um, uh, please give them a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, giving us insight into affordable housing. A very critical theme that we've uh, certainly uh, explored and unpacked over the last two days, and one that certainly requires a lot more attention and focus uh, given the investments that will take place. We'll be sure to continue with the questions uh, that you have, um, and that can take place during the networking session or during the uh, different streams that we'll be hosting after lunch. So what we will focus on in uh, rooms one and room three, this particular room where you are located now will focus more on development, innovation, as well as regional discussions, case studies, and presentations. This is sponsored by the IFC, and of course, you're more than welcome to participate in a variety of conversations, taking a look at uh, the shifts that we're seeing in the commercial space, where it's uh, moving more to occupy a demand, also understanding the um, uh, insights with regard to incorporating renewable energy within these spaces. In room one, which is situated behind this stage, the first door closest to the exit, that is where we'll have the Africa Prop Tech Summit. So everything related to technology, looking at influences and trends in this particular regard, and of course, digitalization and blockchain, which has often come up as a key theme in the real estate environment, will also be discussed in the PropTech Forum. 
the prop tech forum takes place in the room behind us in room one and in this room we'll have the development innovation forum regional conversations uh, taking a look at the advancements and growth seen in a variety of sectors ladies and gentlemen a big thank you once more to the panel please enjoy lunch we would kindly request that you do stick to time a brief 30 minute lunch is what you have in order to ensure that our, we can continue running through with the various streams and forums from 1.30 promptly. So we'd kindly request that you be seated and in the various streams that you'd like to participate in by 1.25. 1.25, enjoy lunch. Thank you so much.